the, this, the title of the sermon is not correct in the bulletin. And it, it, um, I believe in the bulletin, the title is How Do the Wise Get Lost? And um, the real title is When the Wise Get Lost. I, I, I'm not sure. I keep wanting to drink this because I'm thirsty. So I'm gonna, I don't want to drink hand freshener. Um, maybe I like the latter title, When the Wise Get Lost, because it indicates that we all get lost. It doesn't matter if we're wise or not so wise. And I've also found just that those, uh, what do we call the navigation device, GPS, when it's in my phone? It can be wrong. So maybe it's because I don't um, use it right. Maybe I'm the only one who's gotten their phone to get them lost. But I, I would just like to point out that I think part of being alive in the human experience is the experience of getting lost. And throughout the next four weeks, we're going to follow the wise men as they search. And their search is for someone worthy of their adoration. I'm always in awe of the human capacity to dream, of the human capacity to yearn, to search. And it doesn't matter how many times our dreams have failed to come true, or how many times our yearnings have gone unfulfilled. It doesn't even matter how many times we were hopelessly lost while searching for our dreams. Something from somewhere deep within us, probably the place we call our soul. It comes bubbling up and calls us to hope again. At least this is true for those who are fully alive, because the day you and I refuse to hope anymore is the day our souls flatline and we begin to die from the inside out. At Christmas, this hope, this yearning, it's almost unavoidable. It doesn't matter if you're excited about the coming of Christmas or if you're just right now frantically trying to reduce Christmas to a manageable list of these are the things I absolutely have to do by this date. Anyone who's paying attention to their soul will find that at Christmas, we inevitably begin to dream again. Maybe it's the music. Maybe it's knowing what will happen here Thursday night and how the music will, will transform us. All the petty silliness, the disappointments, they slip away and we're left in a purity of a holy moment. Maybe it's the candles on a silent light, or the, maybe it's the Christmas message about peace, hope, love, joy, because these things all are invitations for something deep within us to rise up again and to search for someone or something worthy of our adoration. And along the way, in our relationships, in our precious relationships with one another, in our relationships, we catch these glimpses of adoration, but they're only glimpses. A, a couple stands before us all for their wedding, and they're lost in the magic, in their complete adoration of one another. And they're thinking, I don't really think that the bride and the groom are thinking anything when I marry them. I really do think that they are zoned out. But 
should they have a moment of clarity and have a, a cognitive thought, my hunch is it would sound like this. Well, so far the marriage is working out great. <laughs> And this is why uh, it has been suggested, and it probably is quite the wise idea, for clergy to do premarital counseling about six months after the wedding. And maybe not even six months, perhaps six weeks. Because when the adoration has given way to this realization that they didn't marry a perfect person. They married a human being who sometimes is very grumpy in the morning. And if that's not the limit to their perfection, there are many other things which can be, especially when he loans her one of his cars and she hits the other car with the first car. Sorry, but those things, that's a, that's a real story. It was a horrible moment. But it definitely had broken off the engagement, but they were already married. When those times come and we realize that the people that we love, that we saw as perfection, when we now realize that they've got limitations and shortcomings and maybe short temper, that's when heroic choices are made. Choices to love with grace, choices to love with forgiveness, choices to love out of commitment. The same thing's true when, when parents first hold, hold their newborn children and repeatedly count the fingers and the toes. I mean, they're holding this miracle and they think a star has fallen from the heavens and, and they are holding it. But after the first six months, and now again, I'll back up, after that first week of no sleep, it can become quite clear that this child was not conceived by the Holy Spirit. And that is when this man and woman become serious about their calling as parents of real children. Children we couldn't love anymore if we tried, but children who couldn't try our patience anymore if they were actually trying. I'm sure it was an accident. But, um, families can also give you glimpses of adoration, but usually for only a while. Yesterday, I, I don't know why, well, I do know exactly why. I can't work the DVD player, and so I watched Chevy Chase's Christmas Vacation at least three times. I howled all the time. Of course, half the time I was howling because I couldn't get the stupid thing to work. But, um, you know, we all have these ideas of what it's going to be like. Families coming home for Christmas. And um, I can remember in my Fulton Church, one year, I did not handle it well. I will tell you that up front. One year, this woman whom I just loved, she said, oh, Jim, everybody's coming home for Christmas, and everyone will be happy and loving, and I've knitted everybody matching reindeer sweaters. <laughs> We will stand around the piano and we're just going to sing carols by candlelight. And I thought, is this the same family you had last year? The one, the one, you, the one that kept fighting? Uh, the one where half the family left in the middle of the Christmas Eve service. I, you know, I didn't bring it up. I really, I really didn't because who am I? Uh, we can all tell funny stories about the Ellsworths and matching my one sister loves to get us all matching shirts. And I just hate going anywhere in a group of seven and looking like I'm part of an orphanage. But that's just a little of my rebellion, that's my rebellious streak. Penny means well. And she can sew. The striking thing 
is that in spite of the fact that we're buffeted by reality, uh, substitute hand-knit reindeer sweaters, um, I mean, come on, what adult looks good in that? Anyway, in spite of the fact that reality is sometimes very different than what we're dreaming of, our dreams don't go away. And again, we can get a glimpse of this in our human relationships when we're all at our very best. And I'll tell you how, what it looks like when we're all at our very best. That Christmas Eve, that particular family, all 11 of them did wear their reindeer sweaters to Christmas Eve service. I'm not sure anybody but me knew they had them on because they didn't take their coats off. But what we will do for love what we will do for love, that's when we're at our very best. We were created, our soul, that which lives forever. We were created by God, for God. And the bottom line is, God is your only true soulmate. When, when you're blessed here on earth with, with a soulmate, as many of you have been. That's only to give you a glimpse into the even greater soulmate that you have in the God who loves you and created you and who's never going to let you go. So our yearning is for more than to adore another person. What our souls are seeking at this time of year, we are looking for heaven to break into earth and to be found by God. It's also at this time of year that we begin to use the phrase peace on earth as we recover the dream the angels gave us on the first Christmas. But you know, after over 2,000 years, we've not seen a lot of this peace. Racism is still making us strangers to our neighbors. Violence is still tearing our world apart, including the land, especially the land where Jesus' birth occurred. In spite of our talk about being a global community, there's very little trust among nations. And very few people really are certain that God created them to be special. Because Christmas has a way of bringing out the loneliness, the sense that we don't matter or that we're on the outside looking in. So perhaps these are feelings and realities through most of the year. But then at Christmas, Christmas we light the candles and we dare again to dream that there is a savior for the whole world just as the angel promised. And there's good news to all people and peace on earth. So humans have yearned for a long time. Perhaps you're aware of this, but historically, at that particular moment in time, ancient society cherished this incredible, there was an expectation, expectation, expectance, an expectancy. It was kind of like a lot of people felt on Thursday looking forward to Black Friday. Something big was coming huge and and their expectation was that somewhere and somehow a new king was going to arrive and this king would make the world right the roman historians um oh i know this man so well suetonius and tacticus they wrote that there was a common belief that in their time, a child was being born who would bring all the nations into a universal empire. The Jewish historian Josephus, he claimed that messianic expectations, messianic, 
based on the word Messiah, meaning the anointed one of God, the fulfillment of all the hopes and dreams of the Jewish people, that there would come from the line of King David a savior. Josephus claimed that the expectations for the Messiah had never been higher. The great philosopher Seneca, he wrote about people coming to Athens to sacrifice to the memory of Plato in the hope that a new philosopher king would come from there. And then there's the classical poet Virgil, who wrote about this commonly held dream in his messianic epilogue, where he describes this great golden era of peace that this new king was going to bring, about to bring to all the earth. So hear this. this. This is historical record. Romans, Greeks, Jews, writers from Asia and Persia, they all recorded in history their same common hope that a new savior king would be born. If only he could be found. So it's not then hard to believe that these wise men from the East began searching for this king. They'd been following a star that led them as far as Jerusalem before they got lost. Uh, simply using the biblical record, we know very, very little about them. We don't know that there were three of them. That, that comes from the fact that there is a mention of three different gifts given to the Christ child. You know, there could have been 50 or two. We don't know. Um, we also, uh, they asked for directions when they got lost. So I could suggest this morning we could even doubt that their gender was male. We do know that in Persia there was this social class of philosophers called the Magi, and they were highly educated and they were skilled in astronomy, and they carefully watched the patterns of the stars, which never seemed to change. They always seemed to be in ro uh, moving in rotation around the North Star. So, if a new star or a meteor if it would appear it would seem absolutely incredible to these ancient astronomers and for them it would be a moment to wonder if heaven had broken finally now into earth and they would dare to dream again also remember but God's people, the Jewish people, spent a lot of time in Persia as exiles. As highly educated men, the Magi were probably, they being from that area, were probably familiar with the Hebrew scriptures. And among one of those texts is Isaiah 60, verse 1, which makes a prophecy about Jerusalem saying, Arise, shine, for your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. All of this history, I, I love it. I find it quite interesting. But it is not why I find it easy to believe that some wise men came from the East in search of a new king to worship. No, um, the real reason is that the Bible is depicting not just what did happen, but what does happen. The Magi came, but now how many years have you and I come? We are all looking for the same thing. We've all chased a lot of stars. Like the ancient astronomers, we keep seeing the same pattern that, that revolves around hope and disillusionment. Nothing changes except we keep getting lost, chasing our rising stars of hope. We tell ourselves to grow up, deal with life, deal with the fractured world that we live in. 
We try to give up on our dreams. We try to let go of the relentless search for one to adore. But our souls will not let us do so, and especially not during this time of Advent. For at Christmas, the yearning returns. Whether we realize it or not, this is why our culture makes such a big deal out about this holiday. Advent is four weeks of recovering this deep longing within us. It is a time for us to echo the questions of the Magi in asking, where is he? Where is the Savior? But please notice, the Magi, the wise men did not stay in Persia and think, geez, isn't it just great the new savior king was born uh, somewhere near Jerusalem? I believe we can be hopeful now. No, they didn't stay where they were. They had to go and see him with their own eyes. It's not enough to believe that Jesus Christ, the hope for the world has been born. Virgil believed he would be born. Tatticus, Seneca, and Josephus believed Jesus had been born. Even King Herod believed a new king was born. And King Herod knew the birth was in Bethlehem. But that did nothing for their souls because they did not come seeking this Christ and worshiping him. They did not get lost in adoration. I tell you, it's, it's not enough for you and I to say, I believe. I'm a Christian. Yes, yep, check off baptism. I was. Check off confirmation. Suffered through that. What the Magi yearned for was to see and to worship Jesus. And so do we. Just as certainly as Jesus came into the world 2,000 years ago, so does he continue to come to us through the Holy Spirit. You know. You know when you have seen him. Because it changes you a little bit more. Bernard of St. Croix claimed that throughout life we will all receive moments of recognizing that we are in the presence of Christ. They are glimpses, and as such, they do not last long. But if you love the Savior, you will recognize him when he appears, and then your recognition of Jesus turns into a recognition about your life and about the world around you. And this is the transformation for which we have yearned, longed, and cried out for. So how are you going to use these next four weeks? I beg you. Do not use this time just to stay busy because then you only get lost in it. Dare to dream again and search diligently. Search for Jesus in these moments of worship. Read your Bible. Look for him there. Expect to hear and experience him in the music moments of this season. Search for our Lord in the eyes of small children pure enough to still believe in miracles. And look for Jesus in the eyes of a stranger someone who is so not like you, 
And normally you would try to pretend you didn't see him or her standing there. But during Advent, you can't look away. I see in the eyes of this stranger, your Lord in disguise, and see how grateful their eyes are for any and every act of grace you extend to them, even something as seemingly small as eye contact and a smile, a recognition that they are human, just as you and I. God has given us the gift of these four weeks of Advent. God also gives to us his spirit. Will you and I permit the Holy Spirit of God to be at work in us, opening our eyes and our ears and our hearts so that we might search diligently to find our soul's deepest desire. Amen.